welcome to Uncharted Liverpool, where we're going to delve into some of the more interesting and less well-known parts of Liverpool history. In this podcast, we're going to take a deep dive into some of the more obscure, little-known, and sometimes just plain weird parts of Scouts' history and heritage. Full disclosure, I'm a Scouser. I was born in Liverpool in the late 80s, and in my possibly biased opinion, it's one of the best cities in the country, if not the world. But aside from me loving the city I grew up in, it has some of the richest, most interesting and culturally significant histories of all the cities in the UK. The city has played an important part in the world as we know it today, sometimes for amazing reasons, sometimes for world changing, but sometimes the part it played was dark, apparent and shameful. We will be looking at the good, the bad, the ugly and the uncharted parts of the history of Liverpool. This is Uncharted Liverpool. Hope Street, in the city centre. A street of only about half a mile separates two of Liverpool's most magnificent buildings, dominating the skyline from afar and even more imposing when up close. The two Liverpool cathedrals are icons of the city and their past is just as interesting as their architecture. Up until 1904, when the Liverpool Cathedral first started construction, the city of Liverpool was without a cathedral, one of the few major cities in the UK not to. Obviously, lots of the UK cathedrals had been built many, many years ago, stretching right back to the year 597 when Canterbury Cathedral was founded, and the city on the scale of Liverpool seemed to be missing that certain religious je ne sais quoi. And so, within the space of 80 years, two new cathedrals were built in the city, and in a special two-part episode, we'll try to delve into some of the history of both of these buildings, starting first with Liverpool's Anglican Cathedral. J.C. Ryle was Liverpool's first ever bishop, getting the job in 1880. Educated at Eton and later Oxford, Ryle's first career intentions were based in governance, wanting to originally stand as a member of parliament. But when his father's bankruptcy scuppered his plans to run for office, he swiftly changed his paths and took his holy orders in 1842. Moving through the ranks of various parts of the country over the next 40 years or so, Ryle eventually became Dean of Salisbury, a prestigious role within the Anglican Church. He was obviously thought of fondly, as soon after he was further advanced to the newly created Bishop of Liverpool. He kept his role until March 1900 and died soon after in June. Ryle was buried in All Saints Church in Chilwell, not too far from the city centre, and you can visit his headstone in the church graveyard. On his grave is a Bible quotation from 2 Timothy. I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. But back to Ryle's bishop appointment in 1880. Liverpool now had a bishop, and considering the diocese was basically running out of Liverpool's pro-cathedral of St Peter's on Church Street, a church that many people at the time considered too small and even ugly and hideous, many felt that it was now time for Liverpool's own cathedral to be built. In 1885, an Act of Parliament granted the city a building permit for a cathedral, and the first site was planned for just next door to St George's Hall, where St John's Church was located. The plans were eventually abandoned, as we're finding out to be all too common on Uncharted Liverpool, aren't we? Mainly because the scale of the prospect of the building wouldn't make sense being situated next to such an already grand building like St George's Hall. Today, behind the hall, you can still wander through St John's Garden, essentially the old churchyard of the long-gone St John's Church that was there right up until the last days of the 19th century. It wasn't too fondly considered, so don't worry. One local wrote in St John's. For more than a century, this unsightly structure has been allowed to disfigure the landscape, 
As an example of ecclesiastical art, the Church of St. John has not a single redeeming feature. A bit harsh, if you ask us. Anyway, back to the cathedral. In 1900, upon Ryle's death, Francis Chavez was chosen as Liverpool's next bishop and was immediately keen on reviving plans for a new cathedral. There was, of course, some opposition to Chavez's plans, with many saying there was absolutely no need for such a large amount of money to be wasted on a new building. But Chavez was a stalwart, wanting a great new church for Liverpool to become a visible witness to God in the midst of a great city. Plans continued, looking for new sites and considering the pros and cons of many locations, until eventually four locations were shortlisted. The first two were on the ground to the existing churches, St Peter's and St Luke's, but similarly to St John's, these were found to be much too restricting in terms of space. The two that were seriously considered were St James's Mount and a patch of land between the junctions of London Road and Monument Place, just near where the Royal is located. This triangular patch of land near London Road was the ideal place and was recommended by the committee looking for a location, but it was just too expensive for the diocese to acquire, and so St James's Mount was chosen instead. An interesting quote from Via Cotton, a historian of Liverpool, shows how, with hindsight, the Mount was definitely the right choice. Looking back after an interval of 60 years, it is difficult to realise that any other decision was even possible. With the exception of Durham, no English cathedral is so well placed to be seen to advantage both from a distance and from its immediate vicinity. That such a site, convenient yet withdrawn from the city centre, dominating the city and clearly visible from the river, should have been available as not the least of many good strokes of fortune which have marked the history of this cathedral. St James's Mount was the choice, but how much do you know about the site? We certainly didn't know as much about the area until researching this episode, and we found some interesting tidbits. So here's a brief aside about St James's Mount. We promise we'll get back to the cathedral shortly. If you walk up to the cathedral now, you can see the actual building is elevated on the mount, but technically this comes from the surrounding area being a stone quarry up until 1825. The actual location of the church was Liverpool's first public park and has been called the Mount or sometimes Quarry Hill or Mount Zion, but the pit behind the church was the quarry. After the quarry was exhausted of its supply of stone, the pit became Liverpool's city cemetery and over the course of the years it's estimated that around 57,000 people were buried there. The original quarry began operating somewhere in the 16th century and in 1773, the quarry workers discovered a water spring, which is still flowing today. No, really, go down into the ground of the cemetery from the entrance at either side of the cathedral and head towards the middle of the grounds. Against the back wall, you'll see a little sprout with flowing water and more than likely a few people with big bottles fill them up. Known as the Caliabit Spring, meaning containing iron, it's Liverpool's only known natural spring and local surgeon of the time, James Worthington, claims that the spring waters were good for. Loss of appetite, nervous disorders, lowness of spirit, headache is proceeding from crudities of the stomach, rickets and weak eyes. There are very reports online about how safe it is to drink nowadays, but many people swear by it, and given the amount of people we've seen fill up containers, we'd say it was okay to at least give it a try. We certainly have. It's also worth mentioning that we've seen reports of a grave in the cemetery being affected by the running spring water. Apparently, the body of Captain David Gwynn was found to be completely petrified due to the water running through the grave, Liverpool's own Mother Shipton's waters. Just above the cemetery, to the side of the cathedral, is another building that you can't miss. Built in the ancient Greek Doric temple style in 1829 by John Foster, the oratory was originally used as a place for funeral services before burials in St James's Cemetery. Nowadays, it's owned by National Museums Liverpool and very occasionally, you can access it to view inside. But one thing we've noticed recently, though it can be hard to spot unless you know what you're looking for, is an artwork by Tracy Emin, just outside the entrance. Next time you are up there, peer through the iron railings of the doorway of the oratory and you'll see a metal post rising from the ground. Follow it upwards and a little bronze bird sits atop the pole. 
a very unassuming sculpture given the opulence of the building right behind. In 1972, the conversion of the cemetery into a public park was completed. Most of the gravestones were cleared from the area and you'll find lots of them lining the pathway and tunnels down to the park. It's definitely worth a walk through if you find yourself by the cathedral. So, where were we? The cathedral. The cathedral had just been being lit for St James's Mount. In 1902, the Liverpool Cathedral Act was granted through Parliament and allowed the purchase of the site and for construction to start. Just before this, in 1901, the city held a competition to decide the design for the new cathedral. It was originally ruled that any designs had to be in the Gothic style, which brought significant opposition in the press. A piece in the Times said, To impose a preliminary restriction is unwise and impolitic. The committee must not hamper itself at starting with a condition which is certain to exclude many of the best men. It was eventually decided to allow designs of a classical or renaissance style too. This competition was hot news in the architecture world. It was one of the biggest building projects of its time, and more importantly, it was only the third chance since the Reformation to build a new Anglican cathedral in England. In total, there were 103 entries to the competition, and in 1903, the committee recommended a design by 22-year-old Giles Gilbert Scott, who was basically still a pupil of architecture at the time. He had no existing buildings in his portfolio of successful designs, and he told assessors that, to date, his only major work had been designing a pipe rack. Gilbert Scott was a bit of a controversial choice, given his lack of experience, and even more so considering he was Catholic. He did come from good stock though, both with his father, George Gilbert Scott Jr, and his grandfather, Sir Gilbert Scott, both having designed many churches before, with the latter being famous for such buildings as the Commonwealth Office in London, St Mary's Cathedral in Glasgow, and King's College Chapel in London. With such a prestigious family background of architecture, Gilbert Scott seemed to settle the nerves of most of those who were once nervous of him being chosen. One of the committee members said of Scott, Mr Scott seems to have inherited the architectural genius so marked in the Scott family for the last three or four generations. He is very pleasant, agreeable, enthusiastic, tall and looks considerably older than he actually is. Still, the committee wasn't fully convinced and appointed George Bodley, another leading architecture of the time, to oversee Scott. The relationship wasn't amazing, apparently they were constantly bickering and Giles saw George as a slacker, especially when George accepted two commissions in the US, meaning long periods of absence from focusing on Liverpool. Scott was close to resigning when in 1907 Bodley died and sole responsibility of the cathedral landed on Scott's head. Without Bodley looking over his shoulder constantly, Scott was able to let his creativity flow easier and with more growing confidence, he submitted completely new designs for the main body of the cathedral in 1910. Moving from his original design of two large towers at the west end and a single transept, the shorter transverse part which forms the cross of any cruciform based church design for any non-architecture nerds like us out there, to more radical design of one central tower with two transepts flanking it. In 1910, the Lady Chapel was the first part of the cathedral to be completed and was consecrated by Chavez, the Bishop of Liverpool, on the 29th of June, St Peter's Day. Specifically chosen to honour the church in town used as Liverpool's pro-cathedral up until that point. As you can imagine, as the First World War started and progressed, work on the cathedral practically came to a standstill. There were major shortages of everything from materials to manpower and there wasn't much that anyone could do given the dire situation the world found itself in. As soon as the war came to an end, the quarry of Walton opened again, the quarry where most of the redstone used to build the cathedral came from. Work started back up, and the main section of the cathedral was mostly completed in 1924, enough for a consecration on the 19th of July, in the presence of archbishops from around the globe, as well as King George V and Queen Mary. Scott had still to realise his grand plan for the tower and the transepts, and after consecration, he focused on revising his plan for these parts of the cathedral for a few years. Work eventually began and creeped along at a steady pace until once again another world war halted progress. Even more devastatingly for Scott and the team, 
The May Blitz hit Liverpool hard, and the cathedral didn't escape damage. Although bomb damage wasn't fully repaired until 1955, the central section of the building was considered complete enough to be handed over officially to the diocese in July 1941, and Scott laid the final stone of the tower in February of 1942. The church wasn't fully completed as per Scott's plans, but those would have to wait until things stabilised a bit. In 1948, things got cracking again, and it wasn't until 1978 and after Scott's death in 1960 that the Anglican Cathedral of Liverpool was considered complete. Queen Elizabeth II attended a service in the cathedral in October of that year, officially opening the finally completed cathedral. Liverpool Anglican Cathedral boasts some of the most amazing statistics. The bell tower is the largest in the world and one of the tallest. It houses the world's highest and heaviest ringing peal of bells. It's the world's longest cathedral and in terms of overall volume, it ranks as fifth largest of any cathedral on the planet. It competes with the incomplete Cathedral of St. John the Divine in New York City for the title of the largest Anglican church building. It's Britain's biggest cathedral and the fifth largest in the whole of Europe. It also contains the UK's largest pipe organ and if you're ever lucky enough to hear it, it's just phenomenal. To put it bluntly, we think it's a phenomenal building. It's incredibly imposing and impressive no matter how many times we walk past or through it. The scale is just absolutely unfathomable, especially when you're standing close to it. Going inside is just as astonishing. It's such a huge space that seems to go on forever without an end. It's free to enter with suggested donation, and there are paid experiences to visit the tower for the panoramic views of the city, which we admit is still on our Liverpool bucket list. Keep an eye on the website for the cathedral too, as it hosts many art installations and concerts throughout the year. We've been lucky enough to visit a few, and we're fully convinced that most art projects displayed there are vastly improved by the building. Two more things you need to not miss at the cathedral. One is another permanent artwork of Tracy Emmons inside the building for any fans of hers who are not aware. And the other is the red phone box. You may ask why there is a red phone box in the cathedral. Well, fun fact, Giles Gilbert Scott didn't just design the cathedral, he also designed the famous and iconic red phone boxes. And there is a mini one and a full size one in the cathedral to celebrate this. Meanwhile, whilst all this history has been going on, just down Hope Street, Liverpool was getting its second cathedral, and we hope you'll join us for part two of these special episodes to learn some more about the Liverpool Metropolitan Cathedral. This has been Uncharted Liverpool. Find us on Instagram and TikTok at Uncharted Liverpool, and on Twitter at Uncharted Liv, where we'll be posting some photos and videos relating to this episode. Whilst researching this episode, we read Today's Cathedral. The Cathedral Church of Christ by Joe Riley. The Building of Liverpool Cathedral by Peter Kennedy. As well as visiting the Liverpool Anglican Cathedral and exploring the history they have on the display. Thank you for listening. Please join us again next month for another story from Liverpool's past. Ta-ra!